Decision 2018. The months of buildup and back and forth are almost over. Voters will head to the polls in a highly anticipated election. Many already have. Early voting numbers show turnout could be big. Key campaign contests and important issues are pulling people to the polls. For the first time in 12 years, Idahoans will select a new governor, and they'll decide whether to expand Medicaid, just to name two. Today, the Secretary of State's office on preparing for a large turnout, election security, and what voters need to know. Plus, Boise State University political science professor Jacqueline Kettler on the big races, the big issues, and why this election is a big deal. Ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. And welcome to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. Only two days before the midterm election, we are focusing on Decision 2018, of course. Today we're going to help you prepare for the important decisions you'll be making at your voting location this Tuesday, November 6th. That's if you haven't voted early or sent in an absentee ballot already, and a lot of people have. The polls will be open on Tuesday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. A little later, we'll look at some of the big races and issues in Idaho with Boise State political science professor Jacqueline Kettler. But we start with the numbers and the nuts and bolts of the election. My first guest is Chief Deputy Secretary of State Tim Hurst from the Secretary of State's office. Tim, thanks for being here today. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Well, first of all, um, how has early voting been going so far across the state? What are you hearing from the different counties? We're hearing from the counties that in early voting has really increased. Uh, I talked with a couple of counties earlier this week. They said they've surpassed uh, early voting four years ago. And uh, there's a, a big turnout statewide. And you got a, a absentee ballots as well. Were there more requests this year? Yeah, early voting is a form of absentee voting or absentee mm -hmm. balloting. And that, that also has been increased. Um, they typically vote by absentee ballot if it's prior, if it's by mail, or if it's prior to the time early voting starts, which is generally three weeks before the election. Now we're hearing from you know some counties, including Ada, that have you know uh, and and Canyon that are printing enough ballots for basically 100% voter turnout. How is the state preparing for a potentially large voter turnout? With uh, you know, it seems like there's a lot of interest in this election. Well, the, the interesting thing about it is that the state doesn't conduct the election; the counties do. Mm -hmm. And uh, the instructions we've given to counties, you know, throughout the state have, is to plan for a big election. They've been doing that. They've been ordering, making sure that the ballot orders have been high. Uh, they've been watching their absentee voting. And based on that, they've ordered, some counties have ordered additional ballots because they're, it looks like they're going to have even a, a higher turnout. Now, we had some issues back in the, in the primary election with short, a shortfall on, on some ballots. Uh, you don't think that that's going to be so much of an issue because it's, you know, it, it's not a, a party ballot this time? That's correct. The uh, primary election issue with the ballots was that actually more Democrats uh, turned out and voted than, than the counties anticipated. Uh, and that's where they ran short on ballots and where they got close on ballots. Uh, with the general election, they all get the same ballot. Uh, the party affiliation has nothing to do with it. So uh, I don't anticipate the same problem. We always have a backup plan in case there is a problem mm -hmm. where the counties, if, if they run into a problem with it, they can actually f uh, photocopy the ballots and count them by hand rather than, than use the electronic tabulator. That makes the night longer <laughs> right. uh, getting the results in, but, but we have a way of, of getting around that so nobody gets turned away from the polling place. Um, besides the race for governor, uh, what are you hearing that's really c drawing people to the polls this year? It appears that <laughs> appears to me to be the uh, big draw is the two propositions. Uh, th there's been over $10 million spent on Proposition 1. Alone, just Alone. Proposition 1. <clears throat> and uh, a lot of money spent on Proposition 2. I don't remember the numbers on that one. But that's been a big driver for the, uh, for the election. Um, I have a graphic to show um, about voter registration across the state. According to your office, the Secretary of State's office, as of October 1st, a total of 827,505 Idahoans are registered to vote. Of those, about 427,000 are Republicans, 99,000 registered Democrats. You can see the disparity between the Republican and Democratic registered voters. And there are 291,000 
unaffiliated registered voters. Again, this is as of October 1st. Um, ha have you seen those numbers go up in recent months as, as people register, uh, you know, as people want to, to vote in again this pretty big election? Plus, I mean, the primary was a really big primary for the governor's nomination. Yeah, the primary got a lot of people out uh, to register and to, to vote. Um, the number has gone up. It hasn't, uh, you know, gone drastically mm -hmm. up. It's higher than it was in, you know, four years ago. But uh, uh, there's still Election Day, and Idaho has Election Day registration. And we typically, in a general election, have uh, between 30 and 50,000 people that register on Election Day. 30 and 50,000? Yes. Uh, many of those are people who have moved from one location to another. Okay. And they, so they were already registered, but improperly registered. You mean like that's if they move from county to county within the state? If they move from county to county or they moved within the county. Okay. Um, Got to have the proper address. That makes perfect sense. Um, when, what, what actions, if you can talk about it, um, has the Secretary of State's office in coordination with maybe other state agencies taken to uh, ensure protection mm -hmm. uh, from outside threats or cybersecurity issues. I realize you can't you know, get really into the, the weeds on that one, but in general, the state's been keeping a close eye on this situation. We have been keeping a close eye. We've also worked with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, also the FBI, and, uh, uh, and their cybersecurity folks. Uh, the state has a cybersecurity officer. Mm -hmm. We've been working with them. They've looked at our our uh, voter registration system, our online applications to let us know of any weaknesses that might be there. Uh, and we've addressed those. Uh, and then we just continue to watch that. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest advantage we have with the cybersecurity issues is that the election is conducted at the county level. Mm -hmm. There's no statewide connection. Uh, and all of the tabulating machines are uh, they're offline. <laughs> they're aren't offline. They? None of them are connected to the internet. Uh, they're not even networked to one another. So it's all offline. It's all paper ballot, paper based. So uh, as far as changing the out outcome of the election, yeah. it's I'm never going to say it's impossible, but it's <laughs> sure. nearly that way. Uh, our biggest concern is is someone just disrupting the election. So, um, what have you, have you have you been hearing about any concerns uh, from counties or challenges that they're facing, or is it what you talked about before, just making sure they have enough ballots? Well, the main the main issue that counties have had is just being able to handle the number of people that have been uh, coming in to uh, uh, do early voting or absentee voting, whatever, whichever the case may be. Um, so, what do people need to know? Um, once again, if, if they haven't registered yet and they want to vote on Tuesday. It, Idaho is one of the few states that does have election day registration. And if you haven't registered, you can come into the polling place. You need to bring uh, an identification and a proof of residency. Uh, that can be a utility bill, it can be a bank statement, something with your address on it to show that you've lived in the, at that address for the, you know, for 30 days. Then you're also signing an affidavit that, that you are a qualified elector, that you meet the qualifications, and then you're allowed to uh, register and, and allowed to vote. I've, I've also heard that in, in some cases where someone may not have I, an ID that they can still do the, the affidavit, um, you know, swearing that they are who they say they are and that that is, is good enough. Is that the case? <clears throat> the affidavit works for voting purposes. It doesn't, it doesn't work for registering. If you're going to register on Election Day, you have to have uh, an ID and you have to have that proof of, of residency. Got it. In order to vote, you still have to have an, an ID. If you don't have an ID to vote, then you can use the affidavit. Okay, with just a couple days to go, um, what's a good easy resource for people to go to um, to get some more information? More information is available on our website at idahovotes.gov. Uh, there's a number of others. In fact, your yes. network has a, a link on it, mm -hmm. but uh, idahovotes.gov has the voter information. Uh, as far as what the process is and what's going to be on the ballot. Tim, thank you so much for, for you know, giving us a, an idea of what the situation is heading into Tuesday. It's going to be interesting, of course, to see how it all turns out. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, sir.
Have a great day. You too. And as Tim mentioned, to learn more about all the candidates and the issues on the ballot in your area, you can head to the voter guide at KTVB.com and the KTVB app. We do have links to the Secretary of State's office's website there. And we have a county by county ballot breakdown, link to voter resources page where you can find your polling place. You can also watch the debates that KTVB hosted in the races for governor, both districts of Congress in Idaho and superintendent of public instruction. Plus, you can read the wording of the ballot questions for propositions one and two on Medicaid expansion and historical horse racing machines if you want to see what that's going to look like before you get into your actual voting booth. And there's a lot more there also in the voter guide on KTVB.com. Up next, a Boise State political scientist on the big races, the big issues, and why this election is a big deal, even historic. You ready for this? I am. Let's do Let's it, go. yeah. Meteorologist Rick Lance has two scenarios tonight. One issue that I can't wait to explore is overstressed after school activities. He says his goal is to provide hope when there's just not a lot of it out there. If it's exploring topics beyond the talking points, if it's bringing new perspective to important issues, if it's separating fact from fiction, truth is truth. I, I don't mean to go like, I, no, I it isn't truth. Truth isn't truth. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Monday, Mariah Carey is taking artists to a whole new level. That's beautiful. Thank you, I love you. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> and it all leads to one mind-blowing final steal. <laughs> the Voice, new Monday on NBC. Your reign is almost over. They're about to announce the new sexy man. Do you feel the sex waning from you? Paul Newell and Blake Shelton. You have your own vodka. I told him back there, I said, I don't know if she'll drink with me or not. And the producer said, oh, oh yes, yeah, she will. <laughs> she started around 10 this morning. Plus, a dancing assistant principal. It looks like you've been crying for about a month. Now you're going to make me cry. Weekdays at 2 on Idaho's News Channel 7. Being a dad is an adventure full of special moments. A girl? Unexpected moments. I got this. And even awkward moments. Okay, Dad, thank you. <laughs> but every moment you spend with your kids, <laughs> even the smallest moments, Aww. can make the biggest impact on your child's life. So take a moment to be a dad today. <laughs> And welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. For the first time in 12 years, Idahoans will select a new governor. And for the first time ever, they'll select a female lieutenant governor. They'll decide on whether to expand Medicaid to cover 62,000 people who fall into the insurance coverage gap. And they'll vote on whether to legalize historic horse racing gambling machines. Also, races for both seats in the U.S. House of Representatives and for every seat in the state legislature. These races and issues, plus some of the developments we're seeing across the country and here in Idaho when it comes to women voting and running for office are making this election a big deal. And this is what we're going to talk about now with my next guest. She's Dr. Jacqueline Kettler, a political science professor at Boise State University. Dr. Kettler, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. All right, so first of all, um, are you anticipating higher than usual, uh, higher than usual voter turnout for this election? Uh, I mean, it definitely looks like it's going to be high numbers. Early voting across the country is already, you know, breaking records from previous elections. And um, that's true here in Ada County. Um, at least it was true last, early last week. Um, we're seeing absentee ballots at much higher rate. So, I mean, it's possible that people are just shifting when they vote, but it really looks like we're on track for historic turnout. And I asked Tim about it um, in the previous segment, but I'm curious on your take on what you think um, are the things that are drawing people to the polls. Why are they so interested in this election? Yeah, I think there's a few things going on. One is on the Democratic side, you have a lot of anger, unhappiness at national politics, at the Trump administration. Um, you also have, like, we're often now elections always feel like very um, critical, right? Like we're always at a critical phase in terms of policy direction and things. So I think people feel like um, some urgency um, to get out and vote. We're seeing also on the Democratic side some of the Me Too movement the, and, and the Kavanaugh hearings seem to be motivating people to turn out on both sides of the aisle. So I heard a lot about that possibly being 
uh, a push for more Republicans to turn out because they felt like he was treated mm -hmm. unfairly. But you're seeing that possibly on both sides? Yeah, it looks like it's, it's motivating women to turn out um, on both sides for both Republicans and Democrats. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it looks like it's just kind of push that, I mean, that among a lot of events, sure. right? Like there's, it, uh, politics now happens at a pretty fast pace. And so we're seeing a lot of things happening that just seem to be motivating people to get out to vote. And how about specifically here in Idaho? Is it the governor's race and the propositions? Yeah, I think that um, there's interest in the governor's race for sure. Um, the propositions do seem to be bringing out people to vote, um, especially Proposition 2 may be bringing some um, less frequent voters to the polls, which will be interesting to see how that might affect Can the election. Can you make a guess on how that one might go? I, I, it looks like Prop 2 should pass. Um, it's got bipartisan support, um, and there is opposition, but not as organized as like for Prop 1, or at least not as um, massively involved. And visual. And visually involved, there. yeah. Um, Prop one, probably hard to call right now. Yeah, I really don't know. Um, it, and we're it, talking about the horse racing yeah, gambling the, machines. Yeah, yeah and I, I'm not really sure where, where, where we're at on that one. There's been so much spending, so much negative advertising, um, both you know for and against it. So I, I, it will be really interesting to see how that one comes out on election day. I want to reset the voter registration numbers that I talked about mm -hmm. um, with Tim. We have that graphic to show again. Um, just to recap, once again, it's uh, according to the Secretary of State's office, there are a total of 827,000 registered voters in Idaho. 427,000 of those are registered Republicans, just 99,000 registered Democrats, and 291,000 registered as unaffiliated with either party or any party, including like the Constitutional Party or the Libertarian Party. So when you look at numbers like that, and, and the Republicans have a more than four to one <laughs> advantage over registered Democrats, it really does point to the the, the challenge that Democrats in statewide races face. Yeah, it's a real uphill battle. Um, it's just, it's a struggle when you're looking at a population that leans so Republican that you, as a Democratic candidate for statewide office, you know you have to appeal to Republican voters in order to win. And how do you do that? I mean, is it, you know, we had blue dog Democrats who have, who have held mm -hmm. office before we were fiscally conservative. Sure, yeah, I think you, you often see kind of centrist positions come out on some things, especially like fiscal conservative positions. I mean, you see someone like um, gubernatorial candidate Paulette Jordan being um, more um, pro-guns than some Democratic candidates mm -hmm. across the country. Um, you know, so trying to find some issues that you can appeal across the aisle. Let's talk about that race a little bit. Um, what just automatically makes it historic? Well, I mean, Paulette Jordan's candidacy as a, you know, a woman of color, a native woman, um, being the Democratic nominee for governor is historic. Um, we, you know, this is, this is unusual to have um, a native woman in this position. It's kind of a record, you know, or historic um, in itself, just her identity there. But we're also seeing some interesting developments with more of this progressive nature of politics on the Democratic side being playing much more of a role than we have in previous elections here in Idaho. What do you make of the tone of this, this election? It's actually seemed, I mean, they've had some clashes in debates and whatnot, but advertising's been basically positive about themselves, mm -hmm. no ta not attacking. Yeah, I mean, we saw a lot of negative advertising in the primary for, for Republicans, um, but yeah, the, the ads so far in the general election for the gubernatorial race have been much more focused on kind of positive introductions to themselves, their policy positions, which I, I think kind of makes sense in some ways, like they're just trying to push out, you know, convincing, bringing their voters to out to vote for them and hopefully appealing to more, perhaps with the recognition that sometimes the negative ad can backfire. Now, what do you think makes Lieutenant Governor Little um, a popular, maybe hard to beat candidate in this race? Yeah, he's very much of this kind of business centric um, Republican. Um, he's been really focused on education. I mean, on a primary election night, talking about raising pay for teachers. And so appealing across the aisle a little bit on the issue of education, like we saw at Idaho, or <laughs> the Idaho Education Association endorse him. Um, and so he's got kind of broad support on a few of these key issues. You know, he's been in politics for a long time. He has a lot of uh, support across the state, including including in rural areas, but also in, in like the Treasure Valley. So he's just well connected, well respected for his policy knowledge. And so it does set up to be um, a, a difficult challenge to beat, or de a challenge to beat Especially when you look him. at the registration numbers. Right, too. the registration numbers. And he's been in office for a long time, so he has name recognition. That is, that's true. Um, 
So we talked about the historic nature of Paulette's candidacy, like Paulette Jordan's candidacy in the sense she'd be the first woman governor. She is the first Native American woman um, running for that position as well. Um, but you also have, we will have the first female yeah. lieutenant governor and it's two women running for uh, superintendent of public mm -hmm. instruction. We're seeing more and more women running for major offices and coming out to vote, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, especially looking back to early 2017 with the Women's March, there was a lot of questions on if that would actually result in more women being involved in politics. And we are seeing record number of women candidates this, this year, and that most of them are on the Democratic side, to be fair. Like, we're not necessarily seeing equal motivation or numbers on, on the Republican side. But yes, we're seeing a lot of women um, running for office, out mobilizing, you know, being involved in elections. And, and so I think after the the general election across the country, we're going to see uh, many more women in off elected office than we had before. And when you see more women running for office like this, even if they don't win, I guess, how does that help set the stage for the future? Yeah, it helps normalize having women in these positions, right? Like, you're like, oh, okay, that that's uh, you know, a woman <laughs> was the nominee for governor, and the world didn't end. Like, oh, this is kind of normal, right? Um, it also helps perhaps inspire other women to be involved. Like, oh, I hadn't really considered politics before, but now I can see how I could actually make a difference in that role, or why it, it like it fits for me to run as well. Um, I want to get back to uh, some of the, a couple of the issues. Um, Prop two, mm -hmm. the the ballot initiative asking the voters to approve the expansion of Medicaid to cover 62,000 people who are in the so-called insurance coverage gap. Um, this week, Governor Otter and the First Lady came out um, and endorsed Prop two, saying it's a good mm -hmm. thing for Idaho. Vote for it. How important is his endorsement in that situation? I think it's a pretty big signal, right? Like this is, you know, the governor often acts as kind of a de facto party leader, um, and so you know this is one of the top Republicans in the state endorsing it. And there have been other Republican officials also endorse Prop two, um, but I think this is a pretty strong signal for Republicans who might have been a little bit on the fence, not really sure. Um, it may help provide. Okay, this isn't, you know, this I this is a good thing for me to vote for. And he also endorsed Prop 1, mm -hmm. yeah. the horse racing thing. So same basic uh, weight uh, of that endorsement for yeah, that. Yeah, it's an important cue that people can use if they're not really sure how they want to vote and be like, okay, well, you know, I, I trust Governor Otter or I tend to align with Governor Otter. He's supporting this. Perhaps this, you know, like I'll support it as well. How much of a referendum is this election in your in your in your mind nationwide um, about President Trump's administration because it usually is yeah. in you know in that first midterm yeah. election and usually they lose a house yep. of, of Congress too. Yeah, it's really common. You see that backlash kind of where the other party is more mobilized, turns out at a higher rates and and does kind of punish the party of the president. Um, there's a few instances where the party of the president didn't lose seats in Congress or didn't lose majority, but it's pretty rare that. Uh, pretty much always happen. So yeah, it's this this looks like very much on that trend. And um, is are you still f uh, sensing that it's going to be the house the U.S. House that, that switches over to Democrat control? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's a little hard sometimes to kind of know where, like, these, you know, things will <laughs> eventually um, happen. But, yeah, it looks like the House. I mean, there's some, the Democrats have to hold on to some really tight Dem or Senate seats in order okay. to win the Senate. And so um, I think they're just trying to hold on to what they have a little bit already. And President Trump, of course, is doing his big, 11 stops in so many days yeah. tour really yeah. to you know to get out the Republican vote as well that right can have an effect yeah and I, I mean I think we're seeing it, this is this is going to be a high turnout election not just because Democratic voters are turning out but Republican voters as well Dr. Kettler thank you so much of course great great insight hopefully we can do it again after the election it sounds great and see um, if what we talked about turned out to be true so I, pre good. I appreciate your expertise on this really of course. Do. thanks for having me well I'll be back to wrap things up with a reminder about a one-stop shop for all your voting information needs. Hey, Bronco fans, show us your game day tradition. Share a photo with us and you could win a 60-inch smart TV. Enter now at KTVB's Facebook page or in the Bronco Roundup app. Game Day Traditions, presented by Mountain America Credit Union. Looking for great
great sleep at a great price? Denver Mattress has you covered. During the Veterans Day sale, save up to $500 on select Tempur-Pedic adjustable mattress sets and receive a free $300 Furniture Row gift certificate. Or check out the quality and comfort of the Factory Direct Summit Queen, only $189.99. And to salute our armed forces, all veterans and active duty military get extra savings and free local delivery. Denver Mattress, the easiest way to get the right mattress theme of the Treasure Valley in the last couple of years, growth. Economy is really strong, unemployment is really low. Every time we turn around, we hear about a new development happening somewhere in our area. Well, it's all over, but the voting almost just two days until the polls open and you'll have your chance to have your voice heard on very important races and issues. These decisions could have ramifications for years to come. Again, the polls will be open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Tuesday. Join KTVB Tuesday night for up to date election results on TV and online. We'll also have teams reporting live from both the Republican and Democratic headquarters. In the meantime, to learn about all the candidates and issues on the ballot in your area, head to the voter guide at KTVB.com. It's on the KTVB TVB app as well. We have a county by county ballot breakdown, a link to the voter resources page where you can find your polling place if you're not exactly sure where you need to go that day. You can also watch the debates KTVB hosted in the races for governor, both districts of Congress in Idaho and superintendent of public instruction four of the big races this year. Plus, you can read the wording of the ballot questions for props one and two. That's on Medicaid expansion and historical horse racing machines. We've got a lot more information than that also in the voter guide that you can find on KTVB.com. If you're trying to get to the Secretary of State's website, we have links to that there as well. Well, that is all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tomorrow on today's Morning News and then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint. Dr. Kettler is going to join us to recap what actually did happen in the election. Have a great day.